All right, children, if you would like to head to Children's Church, now would be the time to do that. And the rest of you, I would invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <laughs> you love to hear those little dudes talk. <laughs> Amen. First Timothy chapter three. <clears throat> if you noticed, um, our musicians are gone this week. Um, Cammy, uh, every I've I've always made this deal with her that when our kids moved away. Um, if she wanted to go and visit the kids on their birthday, I would always try to make sure they could do that. And she's in Atlanta this morning uh, celebrating our second daughter, uh, Lindsay, her birth. And so in Cam uh, Nancy and Harold are on a vacation for the next couple weeks. And so um, just again, that's, I'm so thankful for modern technology. And I'm also thankful for guys that can run it. So thank you, uh, Cole and Ron, for that. In 1958, the Green Bay Packers, and you know who they are, God's team, they went, I just have to say this, I'm so disappointed. Um, my three people that I wanted to win in basketball all got beat. I wanted Iowa to win the girls national tournament. I wanted the Indiana State to win the NIT, and I wanted Purdue to win the NCAA. Every one of them got to the championship game, and every one of them lost in the championship game. And that brings me back to the Green Bay Packers. They were 1-10 in 10 with one tie when at the start of the 1959 season, they brought in a coach named Vince Lombardi. That very first year, he led the Packers to a third-place um, finish with a 7-5 and five record. The fall, so they went from 1 and 10 to 7 and 5, third place. The following year, the Packers uh, finished first place, but they actually lost the league championship game. And so many of the Packers players thought when they came back that following season, since they went to 7 and 5 and they made it to the championship game, that it was like, what kind of plays is Vince Lombardi going to set up to get us over the hump? And when Vince walked in, he gave one of his most famous quotes. He grabbed a football, and he held it up, and he said, Guys, this is a football. And we are going to work harder. I'm going to coach harder than we've ever had before. But what we need to understand is we've got to go back to basics. And so with that, Vince Lombardi said, you know, with his famous holding up the football thing, um, there we go. His famous speech with holding up this football thing, he said this, we got to get better blocking, tackling, executing, and he made this pledge to him. He said, we will never, ever lose a championship game again. And by golly, they never did. Never did they ever lose a championship game again. In fact, they won five. They, they were in the championship game in the next seven years in which he was there. They were in the championship game five times, and they went 5-0. and oh, And they won the very first two Super Bowls. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because I think what's been going on in this church at Ephesus, they need this Vince Lombardi kind of a speech. And that's kind of what Paul is doing. It's, it's almost like he's holding up the word of God. And he says, guys, this is God's word. And this is what is to govern us. We're not going to do all these trick things. We're not going to get caught up in all these kind of things that we can get caught up in. We are going to go back to what we would call the fundamentals for the church. That's what he's talking about. And that's what we see this morning. 
Paul is coming to this familiar passage that I have quoted many times in this series. He's saying to him, this is why I'm writing to you so you can know how to conduct your house, yourself in the house of God. And what he is doing in this simple phrase is he is saying to these guys, we're going back to basics. We're going back to fundamentals. We're not going to invent cool ways to try to attract a lot of crowds. We're not going to have a bowling league for left-handed people who are blind. We're not doing that. We're coming up with basic things, and that is this, the scripture. This is what we're coming back to. And so with that, he launches into these last three verses of the passage in 1 Timothy 3, and he says this, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you have some basics, (laughs) so that you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground or support of the truth. And without controversy, which is a a weird phrase in the New King James, a better way to say that is, and with our common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world, and he was received up in glory. This morning, I'm going to look at two of the three fundamentals that I'm going to put up here for you. Paul is trying to remind them who you are. This is who you are, and you have to understand this is who you are. Then he's going to look at, this is what our mission is. And it's important that you understand that you don't get sidetracked with what our mission is. And then he's going to finish it off by talking about what is the message of our mission. Now, I'm going to focus on the first two today. And there's a good reason for that. Because all of these things are prefaced with that phrase, I'm writing so you ought to know how to conduct yourself in the house of God. And so these things are very practical for us, but we have to stop and reflect on what is this saying to us in the church today. And so I'm going to take time this morning and kind of, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, is I hope to flood you with a bunch of how-to things, things that we should be doing, things that are fundamentals, things like tackling, blocking, that kind of a thing in the church of God. And so each one of these points, these fundamentals, are going to guide us in how we ought to conduct ourselves. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, open up our eyes this morning to see some basic truths of how you built the church and how we are to conduct ourselves in the church. And God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see marvelous truths this morning. And God, at the heart of this thing is that we are the pillars and the support of truth. And so I pray, God, open up our eyes to cause us to want to long to know you and your word better this morning. Guide and direct my tongue. Help me, Lord, to say what you want to be said. Nothing more, nothing less. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, I think it's very important because just a casual reading with this, you would not, that, this wouldn't really connect with you. But Paul is writing in here. Uh, he's giving a visual for these guys that, man, it's like, oh, man, we make this connection real e- easily. What he is doing is he is telling them in the church of, or in the city of Ephesus, there was this marvelous temple to uh, the goddess Artemis or Diana. Now, I'm going to put it up here so you can kind of get a picture of it. There is the god Diana or Artemis. Artemis is the Turkish, because uh, if Ephesus is in what we would call modern-day Turkey. Diana is the Greek, I think Diana is the Greek word for that. Um, I could be wrong, it might be the Roman word. But anyway, Artemis and Diana are the same thing, okay? They mean the same thing. But there was this amazing temple. This temple was bigger than even the... Uh, Uh, than any other building in in Roman culture. It was this huge. Uh, One of the historians named Pliny, this is what he says about the temple. He says, the temple of Artemis was situated on a platform about 425 by 239 feet. So it's like 425 feet by 329. 
He goes on and he says the temple itself was 342 by 163 feet. It had 127 columns. And every one of those columns was a gift from a king for this who worshipped the goddess Artemis. Um, It goes on, it says, every one of these columns were made of marble that were 60 feet tall. Now think about 60 feet tall. That's, That's taller than in here. It's just... That's how big these columns are. 36, and they were six feet thick in diameter. That's just how big they are. Um, 36 of these columns were sculptured, and then they were overlaid with gold. That's just how amazing it was. And those columns were studded with jewels in them as well. Each pillar acted then as a tribute to the king who donated it to the temple. The honorary significance of the pillars, however, being, you know, honorary for the king that donated it, was secondary to the function of holding up the massive roof over top of it. So this is an impressive house of idolatry, okay? An impressive house of idolatry, and it's impressive for the stone god Artemis, okay? Paul is going to use this imagery in, this, in these little verses to help connect with these people that this is, this is not who we are about, this temple. And these false gods that are these false teachers that are coming in, we're not getting connected with what's going on in our culture. That's not who we are, is what he's going to do. And so what he does is he's going to contrast, in each of our three major points, he's going to contrast something between that temple and with what the true church is. The first thing that we see contrasted here is, it is in verse 15. He says, I'm writing so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The first contrast he's helping these people to understand is Artemis is a dead God. Diana is a dead God. The church is based on the living God. And with that, he says, so listen, the first thing that I want you to understand then is this. We are part of the living God's family. Now, you see that word house, the house of God? It's the same word we have seen throughout this test, this text. We saw it when it was talking about deacons. We saw it when he was talking about elders. Um, and he said, look, you've got to be stewards of your own house. And we know that that had carried two meanings with it. For example, if you notice back up in verse number four, he says this, uh, an elder is one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And so we see that connection to two things. We see it's connected to how he manages his children as well as how he manages his house, all the things that God has given him. So the first thing I think we see here is that Greek word can be translated as house or household. So I'm going to give you two two ideas from that Greek word. The first one carrying this idea that we are part of a family, the family of God, who is a living God. Remember Ephesians says, you guys are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are now fellow citizens with the saints And you are now members of the household of God. You are now part of the family of God. And who is our head? Our head is Jesus Christ. And who is our father? Our father is none other than God the Father. We are part of the living God's family. And so the first thing that you and I need to think about then, since we are focusing then on what how to conduct ourselves, the first thing that we need to think through then is how do we conduct ourselves as a family? How do we do that? What does that look like? Well, all you have to do is stop, and I'm not going to spend as much time on this because I think we hear this a lot. All you have to do is think of all the one another's in Scripture, right? We're all members of one another. We're all part of one another. So how should we conduct ourselves as as a family? Do we conduct ourselves with love or hate? We conduct ourselves with love. We love one another. Don't you love your family members? I hope you do. <laughs> Let's move off of that. Let's not compare our... No. We love one another. We care for one another. You know, 
Wes is 27, almost 28, and he got a little boo-boo on his cheek yesterday. But, you know, still as a father, I still want to care for him because he's part of my family. I want to care for him. That's what we are to do. We are to care for one another. We are supposed to be praying for one another. Just You can jot down, jot down two prayer requests. Kylie Love was in a car wreck this week. She has two broken, compre- two compression fractures, fractures in her back. And, and we could pray for her. Um, we also, Magenta Hoffmeister lost her aunt, her aunt Sally. Now, the funeral was yesterday. And we could pray for her and lift her up. And just again, help her because she's going to take on, as the oldest child, she's going to take on some of that care for her mom now who lost her sister, who lived with her. We pray for each other. We bear each other's burdens, right? That's what a family does. A family lifts each other up. Our goal is not to tear each other down. It it really grieves me. I'm going to be honest. I might sometimes like smirk with it, but it just grieves me when I hear one child call another child a name that's part of the family. It's like, well, that's just how we are. I know that's how you are, but that's not how it should be. We should let only words come out of our mouth that edifies one another. We all, part of a family, obeys the authority in the family. Our authority is God the Father. We strive to obey him. You see, the head of our family is alive because he is the living God. The God of art, the God of Ephesus, that temple, is a dead piece of statue of stone. That's all it is. It's something dead. And although I think this reference is primarily speaking to the family, God's house being that of a family, I think we could all agree, though, that we are also part of God's living temple, right? We are also part of his living temple. He's making this picture of this temple and he says now you're part of this house you're part of my temple and again we understand the holy spirit indwells in us is the holy spirit dead or alive you can help me he's alive he's living in us we're part of god's living temple Uh, again first peter says this come we come to him we come to we come to jesus as a living stone who was rejected by men, but was chosen by God and is precious. You also then, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, one of our distinct differences is between us and Catholics. The Catholics have this hierarchy of priests. Well, once you, in God's economy, every person who's a believer becomes a priest because every one of us has direct access to God. That's who we are. We're all, we don't have to go to a quote-unquote father or a priest and say, Father, I have sinned, and then he tells us what to do. We, we go straight to our Father, God, I sinned. Would you forgive me? And so when we think of it like this, I want to pick up and I want to think about different ways that we offer up spiritual sacrifices, living sacrifices, because ultimately we are to be functioning as priests in God's economy. There we go. We are, we conduct ourselves like a priest. Now, we saw the job of the priest was to offer up sacrifices. So I want to give a, spend just a little bit of time here, then I'm going to move on, but so I did a quick search on the word sacrifice, acceptable, things like that. And I've got four things, really five, but I'm going to condense them to four. I want to give you four things on how we can offer up ourselves as living sacrifices. All right? That's what we are supposed to do. I'm sorry, I didn't fill that in. We, we conduct ourselves like priests by offering up spiritual sacrifices. Now, what do those look like? Well, first of all, We are to completely offer ourselves up to God. Now, we understand at salvation what happened to us. We all got a brand new soul, right? He says he comes in, I plucked out that heart of stone and I put in this heart of flesh and you are now a brand new creature. 
But this brand new creature is still housed in what? This sinful body. And so we see then in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says this. Look, I'm begging you because of all the things that God have done for, done for you, all these mercies, that you do something that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not a dead thing, a living sacrifice. The priest in the Old Testament, they offered up dead animals. The priest in the New Testament, you and I, we are to offer up living sacrifices. And he says, here's what great one for us to do, is even though your body is still not been redeemed yet, we're waiting at the rapture for when we get our new body, so that our new soul matches, you know, that kind of a thing. And listen, when that takes place, we, we will never struggle with sin anymore. But what God is saying is, look, here, offer up your body as a living sacrifice. Bring your body into subjection. Bring it in so that you can use it as an instrument for righteousness. That is something that is holy. That is something that is acceptable to God. A second way that we can offer up a, a, a sacrifice to God is by sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. That's the second one. Again, this is just who we are. This is our mission. That's who we are. But again, uh, Paul says, look, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's who I want to minister. I want to minister to the Gentiles. And what I want to do with them is I want to minister the gospel of God to them. I want to get them saved, if you will. That, so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. When you and I share the gospel with other people, we are offering up a living sacrifice unto God that is acceptable to him. It's even been sanctified and set apart by the Holy Spirit. Here's the third thing that you and I, this is how we conduct ourselves in the temple of God, okay? That we're all part of, we're all living stones. He's the chief cornerstone, we're all living stones. He's building up the spiritual house made of people. He says, this is a way that you can offer up a living sacrifice. It's by praising me. Again, Hebrews 13 says, therefore, let us continually, because we're alive, we have a living God, so let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. We're going to do that next Sunday night. That's all it's going to be about is us giving praise to God. Just again, sharing with him, singing songs to him, to him thanking him, which is what he says, goes on where he says, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him. You see, how we conduct ourselves in the church is very important to God. And when you understand that you are to offer up spiritual sacrifices as a priest, you understand that your mouth is something different. It's not like the world where we swear and we cuss and we tell dirty jokes, and it's not like that. It's not where we tear people down and we use our words to, to hurt people and to harm people. That old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never... That's crazy. Names will harm you. And we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to say things that lift people up because we are the priest of the living God. That's how it changes our conduct in the church. That's why we do that. We offer up praise to God, thanks to him. The fourth thing is this, and it is by uh, doing good and sharing of your resources with other people. Now, again, to see this in this Hebrews passage up here, verse 16 goes on and says this. So as you're offering up these, these sacrifices of praise, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You see, sometimes, you know, the church gets this name for just always asking for money. And I hope you never feel that way here, because um, I believe it's a heart thing. And when God, when you understand that when you throw, even, even if it's a buck in, in the offering plate or the offering box, that is a way that you can share God-given resources to other people. It, it's like missions comes out of our offerings here, and we're supporting, I don't know, how many, how many missions do you, 12, 14? 20. Okay, Dale's really on top of that. 20 missionaries that we're supporting. I mean, praise God for that. Amen? You know, when people are hurting and they come and they knock on our doors and says, man, I need some help. And so we do a little checking on of that, and then we're able to help them meet some kind of a budgetary need. That's just a way that we can share God's resources and do good. Remember, each of us are part of the living God's house, 
which includes his family and his temple. And as such, we are to conduct ourselves as either a member of the family or as a priest. Thirdly, the third thing here, we are also part of God's living church. Again, notice the rest of that. He says, which is the church of the living God. So we are to conduct ourselves as if we understand that we are the church of the living God. Now, I think it's very important for you and I just to remind ourselves of this. This is one of those fundamentals. Here's the football. He's saying this is not a human institution. What Artemis and Artemis' temple is, that's all about man. That it's all about human institution, building these great big fancy things. The church is something different. It's not human institution. It's not a human organization. Rather, it is God's church. This is God's church. Again, Jesus said in Matthew, he says, I say to you, I will build whose church? My church. And the gates of hell, gates of Hades, will not prevail against it. We know the grave never will prevail against it because Jesus, we just celebrated that a few weeks back. He rose from the dead. Death is not going to keep the church from moving forward. And so Jesus, as we saw over the Easter season, we know this is his church because he purchased it with his own blood, right? Uh, In Ephesians 1, um, I believe 5, it says we are his own possession is who we are. And so again, when you think about What he's saying to us here is, guys, this is a fundamental thing. Here's the football. We have a father that is living and loving, but we also have a master who loved us enough to lay down his life for us, being Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is telling us in the church, make sure that you conduct yourself the way your master would have you conduct yourself, which is Jesus Christ. That's how we function. We don't function based on our human ingenuity. In fact, we just went through all these qualifications of pastors and deacons, and how many skill requirements were there? Zero for the deacons, and there was one for the pastors. They gotta be able to teach. Everything else dealt with how our character was. Because it is so important that God has leaders that are to the best of their ability and the people can see that, that they are trying to model their life like Christ does because he's the master of the church. Again, what is the goal of the church? What is the goal of our master? What is it, the, the preeminent thing that he wants us to do? Well, the answer is seen in 1 Corinthians 6.20. You were bought with a price. Therefore, here's what I want you to do. I want you to glorify God. I want you to give the right opinion of who he is. So whether you eat or drink or do anything, you do it all for the glory of God. And we do it with our body and we do it with our spirit. Now, folks, that's who we are. That's that's us, right? The immaterial part and the material part. He's telling us everything about us. It is our desire to glorify him and you know folks with that um we'll go back to this minute do you see here the trinity at work you see we are part of a living family because we have a living father we are part of the temple um, because we have a living spirit living in us and we are part of the church because we have a living master we have the father the son and the spirit all at work in us And that brings us to our second fundamental. Then what is our mission? What is our mission? Notice the end of verse 15. Okay, we're the church of the living God, and we are the pillar, and a better word, support of the truth. We are the pillar and the support of the truth. Again, Paul points to the imagery of the temple of Artemis in this little section. So I'll put it back up here so you can get a picture of that again. Just as those massive pillars were supporting this roof, we 
the church are like those pillars and we are supposed to be supporting what? We are the support of the truth. So here we see that we are the pillars that holds up God's truth. Again, you can picture that. The pillars, that's the church. And the roof is the truth, the Bible. That's what we are to be doing. That's who we are. That is our mission. We talked about who we are. We're a family. We're a temple. And we're a church. But our mission is to withhold and support the truth of God's word. That is what we are to be doing. Paul helps them to see, just as the foundation and pillars of the temple of Diana were a testimony to the error of the pagan false religion, (laughs) we, the church, are to be the testimony of the true and living God's truth. That's what we are. The church's mission is to uphold God's word. We conduct ourselves with that kind of mindset. Now, this is a little bit tougher here. And so I kind of put this question up here and I just said, so how do we uphold God's word? Like, how do we do that? Well, we're obviously doing that this morning because I'm preaching from God's word. So that's one way that we do that. But I'm thinking about all of us collectively. Now, some of this is going to be like a captain obvious to you. But again, remember, this is a football. It goes back to blocking and tackling and running. We're talking about basic fundamentals. The first way you and I can uphold God's word is simply by believing it. Look, if you don't believe that God in his all power just spoke the world into existence, he did that. Just That's how powerful he is. If you have to come up with some natural selection, natural, not natural selection, some natural way that scientists, they'll tell you it's one to the one millionth power, which is an impossibility. I'm just telling you it's an impossibility, but they have to have that. If you have to believe that this somehow, something from space fell into this water and it's all this stuff started and then the ground was formed and then this, then you had to have this precise time this little pool where where something else fell in it and it created life and then that life evolved over many 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 millions of years and finally that that thing turned into a fish it went from goo to a fish and then it climbed up onto the land and and as it climbed up on the land it started to grow feet and it started to be able to breathe air and so then as it did that somehow it turned into a bird so that a bird could fly around and it could left the ground and started flying and somehow it turned from this amphibian to a, a, a mammal and so it turned into a dog and somehow this dog then turned into a cheetah and somehow this cheetah then turned into a monkey and then somehow this monkey turned into us And so we say from you or from goo to you by way of the zoo. If you really believe that, instead of believing that God in his all power spoke the world into existence, then you're not upholding the truth. You're not lifting it up. You're not holding up God's word. You have to believe this thing. That is so key and so critical to understanding how we uphold the truth. You see... Jesus was teaching in John chapter 6. And he was teaching like, I'm the bread of life. And he's going through and he's talking about how I'm the bread of life. And and you don't understand, unless you eat me, my flesh, drink my blood. He's making this analogy. If you don't understand that I'm the bread, then you're not going to get to heaven. Because I am the only way to heaven. And so he's doing this and these guys are listening to this. And and they're, they're, they're hearing this symbolic teaching of Christ that he's the bread that you have to eat and the and the flesh that you ha- or the, the flesh that you have to eat and the blood you have to drink and they say I, I don't get this that's too hard for me to understand and so they walked away from Christ and Christ then turns to his disciples and he says what about you guys what about you are you going to leave me are you going to abandon me and this is what Simon Peter said to this he said to them he said Lord to whom shall we go we have come to believe And not only believe, but know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You and I have this word that teaches us who Jesus Christ is. And either we accept that and believe it and come to know this is truth or we reject it. We reject it. 
And so at the, the, the simplest way for you and I to come to grips with upholding the truth is to believe in it. Paul testified before Governor Felix in Acts 24, 14. He says, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things, all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, the Old Testament. Paul made it clear to the Corinthians when he said this, we also believe and therefore we speak. You see, the fact is, if you don't believe this is to be God's word, his, his truth that we are to uphold, then everything else I'm about to mention is just going to be ridiculous to you. Because this is the beginning, you have to believe it. Because if you believe it, then what you're going to do is then you're going to love it. Because you finally know what truth is. I, Jesus said, your words is truth. The psalmist says, every word is pure. This is truth. And people are hungry for truth. And when you understand what is truth, that causes you to want to love it. The psalmist in Psalm 119 kind of puts this on over and over. But I'm going to just put two quotes up here. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. This is what I think about when I think about things. He goes on in verse 127 says, I love your commandments. I love them more than gold. Yes, even than fine gold. And you notice the exclamation points. This guy says, I love your truth. I love it. I love it. You will uphold the things you love. That's what you will uphold. You will uphold your, your family. You will uphold your dreaded Sports team, like the Packers or the Cubs, you'll uphold them. You'll talk about them. I'm just saying how we conduct ourselves in the church is we uphold the truth by loving it. Thirdly, we uphold the truth by studying it, by studying it. Paul will tell Timothy in his second letter to Timothy, he'll say this, look, be diligent to present yourself. The word be diligent carries the idea to study yourself. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know this. If you truly love something, then you will set your heart to learn about it. Um, I'll give you a silly example and then a serious example. I love the Cubs. I studied who their trades were. I studied who's going to be their leadoff hitters. I studied who's going to be there. I mean, I just like the Cubs, okay? And, and I'm just telling you, you know, there are people in here today by memory can tell me all the statistics of whoever their favorite team is. My question is, why? Because you love them. So when we think about, well, do we memorize Scripture? That's one of my goals this year is I'm trying to memorize a big chunk of Scripture this year. Might fail, but you can ask me how I'm doing with it, okay? And I'll be honest with you, but that's my goal, is to memorize that. Another way that we prove something we love is we study it. Men, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, verse 7, to live with your wives in an understanding way or according to knowledge. That's what it means. And in that passage, it's basically saying, do you study your spouse? Because you have to live with her according to knowledge. What is it that she needs? What is it that are her hurts? What is it are her goals? What are the kinds of things that you need to wash her with? Again, if you love your wife, you study your wife. So you know what you get her for a gift. Now, the tough time is, is when they keep changing on you, but that's okay, kind of a thing. So again, by studying it, that's a way that we uphold it. We really love this thing, so I'm going to study it, is the way. And, and the fourth thing is then by obeying it, by obeying it. Uh, again, Jesus said in Luke uh, 12, 11, 28, blessed are those who hear your word and keep it. They keep it. Uh, in Ezra, in Ezra 7, uh, verse 10, he says this, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. So he's, that, that's the first half. He loves the word, so he's studying it, he's seeking that, and then he is preparing his heart to what? To do it, to do it. You see, it does little good. 
And I, I've thought about before I said this, but I'm going to say it because I think I, I still believe this is true and accurate. It does little good to believe the Bible, to love the Bible, to study the Bible, and then say, but I'm not going to do what it says. It does little good to do all those first three things. But when we do obey it, we are telling everybody, this is truth. And because it is truth, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Fifthly, by guarding it, by guarding it, by guarding it. Paul will again tell t- later to Timothy. He says this, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So again, we see that Timothy was given this command to guard this thing. Now, the word guard in the Greek, by implication, means to preserve it. Okay? So, God has given us this word He says, now I want you to guard it. I want you to preserve it. So we have this thinking then, okay, I preserve it, then I'll never read it. I'll lock it away in the safe, and therefore it'll be preserved, and nobody will ever get it, you know, kind of a thing. That's not what he's talking about here at all. Um, Again, what he is talking about by guarding it is I want you to guard it or preserve it by doing this. I want you to take this word, make it your own, and then pass it down to your children so that they will make it their own, so that they will take it and pass it down to theirs. That's what he means by guarding this. It, it, it's the word to observe, to preserve. All that is carried with this idea of guarding something. Now, I think this is very important for you and I to understand that if we love this truth, it, it's just like the Packers. I'll give you that simple example. I have passed... My love for the Packers down to Levi and to Wesley and to um, um, Lila and to Alicia. Uh, As of right now, um, Lindsay could care less. But that is just such a small thing, folks. My love for baseball, my love for basketball, it's such a small thing. What really matters Does it really matter to you if your son can hit a home run or that your son understands what truth is? Which is the big thing here? What is the most important thing? You see, God has entrusted his word for us, and we are the pillar of this truth. We are the guardians of this truth. We are the upholders of this truth. Uh, We see a classic example in... um, Deuteronomy, and this is a passage I use most of the time when we do a baby dedication or a child dedication. It says this, these words which I command to you today, this is, by the way, this is um, passage God had told Moses what was going to give, uh, that he was going to give the law to him so that he could teach the people. And then Moses says this, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So you have to have this in you, and then you shall teach them diligently to your children. And we're supposed to talk about them when we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when you go to bed, and when you get up. You're supposed to bind these, if if you will, as a sign on your hand, and and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. They took that literally and actually made these little boxes with the scriptures in it, and they tied them around their head. And he goes on and he says, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. God wants us to pass the truth down to the next generation. That's the idea. It it saddens me, and I'm not, my desire is not to get political, but I'm going to. It saddens me that the church has failed America so greatly. We see the problems we see today because the church has not stood strong on what the truth is. We have not done that. We compromise and compromise and compromise all the time. And we sit back and we talk so negatively and angrily about the culture. And in reality, the culture is a reflection of its religion. This is a reflection of who we are, our religion in our country, folks. 
Our religion was Christianity. And we have not guarded the truth. We have not upheld the truth. And we're reaping that today. You see, God illustrates this word over and over of passing it down. Here's another passage. He says, look, I will, this is Asaph just talking about the children of Israel. He says, I will utter hidden things, things from old, what we have heard and known, what, we have, uh, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob. He established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. <clears throat> And then, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. They would put their hope in God. We have failed by not helping our children see where their hope and trust lies. It does not lie in the government. It lies in the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ. Folks, this is a fundamental that we are to uphold the truth. Now, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go through these quickly here. Let me give you the last two. Sixthly, by defending it, by defending it. Again, the lost world will always attack truth. That's why today nobody knows what truth is. It's whatever you want it to be. And, and, and Jesus' is half-brother Jude comes along and he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to want to write to you concerning our common salvation, that's what we want to talk about. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Whenever you have the definite article, the, in front of faith, it means the word of God. So again, contend earnestly for the scripture, which was once for all delivered to the saints. You see, we have lost that battle, what we call sanctity of life. We have lost the battle on sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman. We've lost those battles in our country. And the reality of it is we are losing those battles in the church today. There is absolute truth, folks. It is the word of God. There is an absolute picture of what a marriage is. It is between one man and one woman for one life. That's God's word. There is absolutely truth, that sanctity of life, that every person born is precious and special because it, every person born is a gift from God. And we don't have the right to look into our medical superiority and say, that child's going to have Down syndrome, let's, let's abort it. Oh, that child's going to have cerebral palsy, let's abort it. We have no business doing that. We don't get a look at the people who are older in, in, in nursing homes, and they have no thinking, no cognitive at all, and, and we say, that person doesn't have quality of life, put them to death. We have no business doing that because the God of the Bible says he is the author of life and death, not us. We are to, to defend this scripture as absolute. There is only... Folks, this just burdens me when I hear churches and I hear these celebrity pastors talking about, well, do you think that Buddhists will go to heaven? I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Joel Olstein was on Larry King Live, and he was asking him, do you think Hindus will go to, church, go, go to heaven? He said, Larry, I just don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of good Hindu people. I just don't know. Look, folks, this isn't us. This is all he would have to do is say, you know, Larry, I understand how we can think that way humanly. But the God of the Bible says this. There is only one name under heaven by which a man can get saved. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way because he is the life and the resurrection. He is the guy. And so according to scriptures, unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can't go to heaven. It just grieves me. Paul told the church at Philippi, he said simply this, I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. That's who I'm appointed for. This is a fundamental truth to de fundamental defend the truth of God. Finally, and obviously it's by proclaiming it. Paul will tell Timothy again in his second epistle, preach the word, 
be ready in season and out of season. I don't know what that means, but I do know this. If it's in season, then it's out of season something else. And if it's out of season, then it's in season. So that simply means to me there's no time when it's not in season. It's always to be preached, whether it's popular or not, whether it's in season, whether it's out of season. We are to convince people. We are to rebuke people. We are to encourage people with all patience. We need that. Patience and teaching. You see, it is the living God that produced the living word. This word is living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, right? This word will endure forever because, again, it is through the preaching of the word that you and I get saved. The Bible says this, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then he quotes a passage from Isaiah, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of men as the flower of grass. The grass will wither, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word, now this word is the gospel that was preached to you. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Folks, upholding the truth of God means we proclaim it boldly. Yes, we must believe it. If we believe it, then we will love it. And if we love it, we will study it. And if we study it, we will obey it. So then we're going to obey it by defending it, right? We're going to obey it by proclaiming it. That's what we're to do. This, if I can go back to my illustration, this is the fundamentals. This is the word of God that we must always go back to. Father, open our eyes today to see the truths from your word. God, I know I'm not an eloquent speaker. But Father, I pray that your spirit would take the words that you want embedded in people's heart and that you would do what your word says, that you would just again help us if we need conviction, that we would be convicted of it. God, if we need encouragement to keep on defending it, maybe we've been defending it and we're ready to quit because we're getting so uh, mocked uh, from other fellow workers or fellow friends or family members. God, may this sermon help encourage them not to do that. This is our mission to uphold, to support, to be the pillars that hold up the word of your truth. God, so I pray for the person who might need convicted to start, that you would encourage the person not to give up. And God, that you would help us as we think through in just two Wednesday nights about how to proclaim your word to the lost world. Because it is the living word. It is not incorruptible, but it's, or it, it is not corruptible, but it is incorruptible, God. And it's what brings people to Jesus Christ. May we have a passion for wanting to proclaim your word as our mission. We ask this in your name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together.